Hi, everyone. My name is David, and today I'm going to be talking to you about extending Kubernetes, or how I learned to stop worrying and trust the spec. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about specifications in general, uh, but I'll be pulling examples and lessons learned from my own experience working with the container storage interface, uh, which is a storage-related specification uh, that we'll discuss a little bit later, but just as an example for the lessons that we learned. So before we start, a little bit about me. Um, sorry. A little bit about me. I am a software engineer at Google. I'm a current SIG storage contributor, and I've been working on and with the container storage interface since before 0.1. Um, and we actually hit a pretty big milestone recently where we released version one with Kubernetes 1.13. Uh, I'm also a developer for the GCP persistent disk CSI driver, so I've kind of worked on both ends of the specification. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a little bit. Also, I recently broke the record with some friends for the Houdini escape room in SF. And if you ask my coworkers, I've been bragging about this for about two weeks now, and I really plan to milk it until the new year. All right, so before we start, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Kubernetes storage, kind of circa 1.9, right? So before I talk about the specification, I want to talk about what exists before the specification and why we decided to move to a more extensions-based model. Okay. And to do that, I have to show you what it was like in the dark ages of the now ancient 1.9. Um, Super important to note that this is probably the system that you're still using now, and it's not actually that ancient. This was maybe three months ago, or a year ago. Anyway, so to motivate this talk, um, I want to talk a little bit about what storage looks like in Kubernetes right now. Um, so basically what happens is storage vendors uh, that want to provide their storage in Kubernetes to Kubernetes workloads kind of write special bits uh, that make their storage available. And this is actually a screenshot of the Kubernetes code base. Um, and you can see that all of these vendors, uh, all of these driver vendors, build their code directly into Kubernetes. So that ends up in the Kubernetes con uh, Kube Controller Manager, as well as the kubelet. Okay? Um, and so in this paradigm, actually, being a maintainer for Kubernetes uh, was super hard. And I think Michelle said it best, uh, who is a Kubernetes storage guru, by the way, uh, where she says, code for storage plugins it, that are not supported on your platform are still a risk. And so going back to how everything is built into the same binary, um, a good example of this would actually be this pretty nasty bug we had a while back, where uh, if you tried to provision a, like a volume for a storage provider, that was not on our system, um, it would actually go into this storage provider's code. This vendor code would actually look for config that did not exist, because obviously we don't actually support that vendor, and it would segfault. And you may be thinking, what, what segfaulted? Well, Kubernetes segfaulted. This was actually the kube controller manager that was running this code and would just blow up if you tried to use code that really shouldn't even be in there, because we don't support that vendor at all. Right, so that's one of the problems. But on the other end, so being a storage vendor was also really difficult. So that was the storage maintainer. That's someone that works on Kubernetes. And then it's really difficult to be on the other side, too, someone that's trying to make your storage solutions available inside of Kubernetes. So here's a quote from Xing, who works on OpenSDS. Um, what she said is, if we found a critical bug in Kubernetes, or in our plugin after the Kubernetes release, we don't really have a way to release the plugin separately. And so this comes down to the same problem. Um, I have a bug. I immediately, because I'm a great developer, I'm seeing, I find, make a bug fix, and I immediately submit it. Well, first you have to get through the Kubernetes PR process, right? You have to get through all the reviews, all the approvals, which if you've worked on Kubernetes, you already know is quite a lot to ask. And then once that happens, you can't actually release a new version of your plugin at all. 
you have to wait for Kubernetes to then give another like, .x release before your bug is fixed. So obviously, that's not ideal as well. Uh, so just to reiterate some of the problems we wanted to solve, we wanted to allow vendors to iterate at their own pace. We wanted to stop crashes in drivers, bringing down all of Kubernetes. And we wanted to reduce the maintenance burden for Kubernetes approvers. So I didn't really cover that last bit too much, but as a Kubernetes approver, uh, you had to review and maintain code that's all built into the code base that you may not have a lot of context or expertise on. So hopefully I've convinced you that we need something to fix it. And what we came up with was the container storage interface. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about what this is. Um, the way I see the container storage interface, uh, it might not be exactly what everyone sees, but I see a few, a few sidecar containers, some storage drivers. Uh, so those, these are equivalent to those entry vendor directories that you saw earlier. Um, some pieces inside a container orchestrator. Uh, in our case, we care about Kubernetes, but also this is supported by Mesosphere and Cloud Foundry, um, as well as the specification itself, which is kind of like an RPC layer that vendors and cloud provide, or container orchestrators can both uh, code to. Um, and kind of most importantly, it lets us move the storage provider code outside of Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, so what does it look like exactly? It kind of looks like this. This is by no means like a complete diagram. I just picked a couple random storage vendors here. Um, and I, I think maybe there are more container orchestrators that support it. But we have this RPC boundary in the middle, and we have people consuming it from almost two different worlds. right? Um, and this is going to motivate some of the lessons learned that I'll talk about later. So what does the specification look like exactly? Well, uh, here are pages one through three. I'll give you a little bit of time to read through it. All right, so hopefully now we're all experts on the specification. Um, so let's move on. I'm, I'm just kidding, by the way. I don't expect you guys to know anything about the specification. Um, as I alluded to earlier, this talk isn't actually about the container storage interface. Right? Uh, it's actually what I want to do is just share some challenges that we faced and some of the learnings that we had from building an ecosystem around this specification. So uh, what better way to start than to talk about learning, learnings that we have about changing the specification itself, uh, specifically the process of updating the specification. So the problem here, are, you may remember this diagram from three slides ago. Um, Basically, what you may have noticed is that quite a lot of people care about this specification and what it does, because there's people on, you know, there's, there's I have four over here, but there's actually probably more, something like 30 vendors, right? Um, and then there's, sorry, um, then there's container orchestrators on the other side. So a lot of people kind of care about what this specification is, um, and there's a lot of concurrent development across multiple projects. So specification changes are super important for, and for developers to understand what's going on. All right, so there's lots of moving parts, and we want everyone to be on the same page. Oh, sorry. Accidentally skipped a couple pages. So one of the most important things that we did in order to keep everyone on the same page and to keep all the developers kind of happy and understanding was using a transparent and development open forum. So that, that's the Octocat from GitHub. So what we actually have is the specification and all of the development and changes that go into the specification are on GitHub. And so people interact with it like, just like they interact with Kubernetes. They submit pull requests. People can review it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, so basically what that means is that all consumers of the specification from both ends can look at the development and jump in and make changes, make decisions, and be involved in the process of actually changing the specification. So uh, here's a quick example. It's a little bit hard to see, uh, but this is a change that I made from the very early days, uh, pre-0.1. And as you can see, it actually already has, it had 100 plus comments and about five reviewers. Um, 
And the power of this is actually as a developer, as a storage vendor developer or a CO developer, um, when you're looking at this call, which is called node stage volume, if you're like, what does this do? Why did they put this in here? This seems absolutely insane. You actually can go back on GitHub and take a look at the original proposal, as well as all the discussion, explanation, questions, and changes that were made to the specification that were made in the process of getting this change merged. So there's a full record of the discussion. And let me show you a little bit more recent change as well. Um, so this is adding snapshots into CSI. So this comment had, this PR had about 200 plus comments and 10 plus reviewers. And these people actually represented people from all different sorts of storage vendors and multiple container orchestrators. Um, so all of them kind of wanted to make sure that the specification change met their needs. They all wanted to understand what the change meant to them. Right, so, and after this process of going through this pull request merge process, Actually, all of these, or many of these people, at, by the end, were completely on board and actually become advocates for your specification change. And that's invaluable when you're trying to get people on board. And for those of you that are actually paying a lot of attention, you may have noticed that this PR was actually closed and not merged. Um, and there's a reason for that. Well, it turns out that there were actually so many comments on that GitHub pull request that GitHub was failing to serve that website to people that were trying to look at it. Um, and so Xing, what Xing had to do was actually open another PR that went through review again in order to get this feature merged. So rest assured, Snapshots is currently in CSI. So what I'm trying to say here is that open collaboration promotes consensus. So if you're looking for consensus on a specification, it's helpful to have a lot of people working out in the open transparently and collaborating together. So next, I want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned on developing an ecosystem to help people use the specification. So the problem here is that the specification isn't actually just an RPC boundary. Um, it's actually a large body of text kind of defining the usage, different error codes, and the control flow of what happens when you're using this specification. So as with any text, uh, as with any large body of text, people from different backgrounds and different mindsets can read the exact same words on the page and actually come to very different interpretations of the specification. Um, so how did we solve this problem, or partially solve this problem? Well, we actually developed this thing called CSI Sanity, which what that is is kind of a light conformance test suite just to uh, make sure that the basic specifications are met. So this is by no means a full end-to-end -end test suite. It doesn't check any of the back-end implementations. Right? It's agnostic to vendor. It just checks that, like for example, if you're doing this certain thing, this certain error comes back. Right? And this is great to catch subtleties and other pieces that you forgot. And so when I ran the CSI Sanity for the first time on the GCE driver, I was actually failing about 10 tests out of 12. Um, and those were hard to catch otherwise. So, and, and I actually had to fix all of those to become CSI spec compliant. Right? So, this is a real uh, fake example of what CSI sanity test failures look like. Uh, in my case, uh, this RPC call is returning an error code three, which means not found, uh, when it should actually be returning an error code five, which is invalid argument, okay? Uh, so this might actually seem really inconsequential, not super important, but I'd actually like to dig into it a little bit more and prove to you that it actually is very important that we agree on whether it should be not found or invalid argument. Um, so for, this was a real uh, thing that happened, actually, by the way, for the specification, um, and a real argument that we had. But on a strict definition of the spec, uh, for certain cases, it's actually fairly easy to make the argument either way, right? Like, if you wanted to return not found, you could make that argument. If you wanted to make invalid argument, you could also make that argument on strict definition of the specification. 
Um, so different drivers were actually implementing the same case with different error codes. Um, but CSI Sanity was able to kind of catch that. And what I noticed was that previous error, right? I had some error, and I was like, why is that happening? And this is kind of important, because when we have an RPC boundary, uh, small inconsistencies can actually cause different, trigger different behaviors upstream, right? So in this case, if my driver was to return invalid argument, maybe the, the person or the container orchestrator consuming it on the other end interprets that as a user error and surfaces it to the user for them to change their argument. Whereas if we return a not found error, maybe Kubernetes then interprets it as needing to create an object or something in response to that to make sure that we could actually find that object. Right? So it's possible that these small inconsistencies can make very large changes upstream. So what I'm trying to say is that conformance tools maintain consistency. Okay, so if you want consistency across all interpretations of your specification, maybe you should make a conformance tool. And lastly, I want to discuss one more thing, uh, which is lessons about getting adoption for your extensions. And so the kind of problem here is that a lot of, and this will be shared with other uh, extension mechanisms as well, but a lot of Kubernetes extensions are actually going to be, and in our case is, a replacement for existing functionality. Okay, and this pattern might pop up again. So we currently support uh, the old way of doing things while also supporting container storage interface. And so as a user, it's, it's kind of difficult to get users to move to the new way of doing things, this extensions way, when the alternative just works, right? So we want users to go from this state of kind of confusion to a happy user, right? And how are we going to do that? Well, we're still in the process, so this is a little bit fuzzy, but our strategy so far has been to add value, to C add more value to CSI to get users to move independently. So I want to make it very clear that we're still supporting entry plugins. Um, if there are any bugs or problems, we still patch those. But new features on drivers get added to the container storage interface. For example, snapshots. Um, so snapshots are pretty important functionality. A lot of people really want it. And we're adding it to CSI, but not to entry plugins. Um, and currently, this is in alpha. So in the future, more features like this will be added, where we're adding new functionality to CSI and not really adding it to the older version. And hopefully, that will drive user adoption. Uh, that will add enough value to CSI that people will move over. Another thing that we're doing that's currently in flight um, is a new test framework for CSI that kind of lets you plug your own driver in to existing Kubernetes E2E tests for storage uh, so that every driver can now run the Kubernetes E2E suite. And these are tests that the Kubernetes maintainers have kind of decided are a set of things that we want volume, volumes in workloads to do. Um, so you get all the benefits of the same entry tests, except you can run them on any CSI driver. So currently, uh, I'm sure other vendors are also running tests, but a lot of the time they're kind of hard to find and they may not be the same set of tests. So with this new framework, uh, what we hope to do is have everyone running the same set of kind of Kubernetes E2E tests, and if you pass all of them, it's at least a basic understanding of, yes, we support Kubernetes. Okay, um, and as a little proof that we're actually getting some adoption. Um, here's a list of drivers that are currently listed on the CSI documentation page. And I can assure you that this is not actually a complete list, as I've t already talked to a lot of groups at KubeCon that have mentioned that they have CSI drivers, but I can't find them up there. So if you're one of those people and you want people to find your driver, add it up there. Um, and of course, I can't actually attribute all of the success of CSI to those two previous examples that I just made. But I think we're getting pretty good adoption so far, and that's generally a good sign. 
But the point here is that adding value accelerates adoption. So if you want to get adoption in your new fancy extensions mechanism, try adding value to that and just supporting the old one without adding new features to it. Um, so I just want to reiterate again that these lessons, although they come from my experience with CSI, they can actually be taken and applied to most arbitrary extensions or specifications. Right? They're actually quite general. Um, and I'm sure these patterns will pop up more in the future. Um, so the three points I really want to drive home are that having an open development process really gets everyone on the same page. You, in the process of actually making changes to your specification, if it's open and transparent, you can actually build a group of advocates for that change that can then go and like, spread the gospel about it afterwards if they were involved in the process. I also want to remind you that uh, the RPC definition often isn't enough. Right? We, we might need tools that exist external to the RPC definition to enforce consistency and to make sure that everyone's on the same page when they're de developing their drivers. Also, we want to give a compelling reason for people to move to this new paradigm. We don't want to force people over, but when there's enough value add, they're going to move themselves. So what I'm trying to say is that the specification isn't everything. In order for a successful specification and extensions mechanism, you actually need this whole ecosystem of, of projects that support it, as well as a whole bunch of processes that help, it make, that help make it successful. And so the title of this talk is actually a little bit misleading. I think it should have actually been this, but it rolls off the tongue a little bit less. Again, uh, my name is David. Uh, you can contact me by email or follow me on GitHub, um, and I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Yes, question? Yeah. Um. Sure, sure. So you spoke about the sidecars and the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, if I understand correctly, the sidecars are there to sort of intercept the creation of a PV and then make a call to the uh, volume plugin, actually implement the CSS spec, right? That's what the sidecars are for. And if that is true, shouldn't that be part of Kubernetes code? Because uh, the, the CO should be implementing the CSS spec and be making the calls to the uh, volume plugin directly, not via the sidecars. Uh, okay, so this question is specific to, to CSI, um, and I believe you asked, why are the sidecars not part of core Kubernetes if they are implementing the spec? Is, is yeah, the sidecars are in charge of basically looking out for PV uh, objects in the Kubernetes API server and then making a call to the uh, volume plugin, right? Yes, so what we have with the new volume plugins is that the method of deployment is that they're actually all containerized inside of pods. Um, and so in order to achieve that, we deploy the pods with the sidecar inside. And the sidecar does the like, viewing of the Kubernetes objects. And that sidecar object makes the calls inside the same pod to the driver itself. Right? So the RPC layer actually exists. Uh, for some calls between the sidecar and the driver. Right? If it was in Kubernetes, you wouldn't be able to co-locate it in the pod and have it call out like that. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you for coming to my talk. I uh, hope you learned something today. And have a great rest of the KubeCon.